Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Um, my name's Cole. Um, we have a couple of great books here on sale. Uh, Dear Reader, which is the book that we're celebrating tonight, is something that I finished earlier this week and found completely captivating. And I hope, I'm glad to see you all here and um, I'm sure that that'll be illustrated in tonight's talk as well. Um, the Man of the Hour, uh, our dear writer, Michael Malice is someone that I met at the release party of this book that I wrote, Hacking the Future. Um, we got to know each other because he spent the entire night chatting up my mother, who was visiting New York uh, for the first time. And um, uh, from what I understand, Michael, um, being Soviet-born, um, basically wanted to learn more about what his parents went through uh, growing up under Soviet rule. and decided to take a trip to North Korea. And he bought every book of propaganda he could find, presumably all of these written by Kim Jong-il, the former uh, ruler of North Korea, and um, you know, col uh, collated that into a pretty interesting book. Um, and uh, he pitched it around and nobody understood it, so he decided to put it out himself. Um, and very successful Kickstarter later, he self-published, and um, you know, now you have the, f the finished product. Um, Michael has ghostwritten, I'm sorry, not ghostwritten, I've made that mistake before, co-written. Um, his name appears on the cover of the book, so that means he's a co-author. Um, he is a co-author of several books. Uh, he has written alongside UFC champion Matt Hughes. He's written for the comedian D.L. Hughley, and um, musician Brett Michaels, who a lot of you might know better as a reality TV star. Um, so he decided to turn his, at his attention to someone who could realistically be called the most mysterious man in the world um, up until his death a few years back. And um, uh, I've, I finished the book, like I said, about a week ago, and it's kind of a comedy and it's also a tragedy. And it starts off with the phrase, I remember the day that I was born perfectly, no comma. Um, which I think sets the tone pretty well for the rest of the book. Um, it's, it's a book that makes you constantly question, is this guy crazy? Um, is he that self-deluded that he actually believes these things that he's saying and that are being said about him? Um, or is he that just that cold and calculated and removed from humanity that um, it doesn't phase him the fact that his entire country is failing and starving and dying? Um, so it's it like I said, it starts off really funny though because he, there's all these stories about how he's performing these kind of miraculous things and um, you know the w when when he's born the sun shines down and parts a storm and you know he climbs a tree at age three and he surprises all the adults around him with his magnificent intelligence and you know, he, he almost reminded me of like a tiny little chubby Eric Cartman running around. <laughs> <laughs> encouraging his friends to criticize themselves and tattling and ingratiating himself with the right people. And, uh, and then over time, he gains more and more power and being the son of Kim Il-sung, um, the leader of the revolution, um, of course, uh, eventually develops ultimate power. And it, it starts off kind of rosy and he's making all these changes and he's you know, leading groups and building things and after a while, it, it kind of starts to fall apart and turns from a comedy into a dark comedy. And, um, you know, you have this tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance on display where things aren't going the way that he envisioned. And it's not because it was a bad idea in the first place. It was because they're not doing the bad idea hard enough. And, um, you know, then the, the dark comedy uh, over time turns to tragedy and you start to see um, references to some pretty troubling things like um, the one that sticks out in my mind are the little sparrows, which is the, the Korean word that they use for um, these little kids that are orphaned and starving and basically spend their lives um, rooting around in garbage pits trying to find anything edible, bark or grass. Or and uh, of course, none of this has anything to do with poor leadership or, or the system of government. It's all because there are these unseen enemies of the revolution that are preventing them from achieving greatness. So it's, it's an amazing book and I encourage everyone to pick up a copy. We only have a handful, but um, you can get it on Amazon 
um, and I encourage you to do so. So um, without further ado, I'm going to welcome our dear writer, Michael Malice, up to the stage. Okay. So I remember the day that I was born perfectly. This is something Kim Il Jung presumably said. No, no, no. So it's that said about him. All the funny lines come from me. So oh, uh, okay. <laughs> how I uh, how I wrote this book, you know, I I read all the Western books about North Korea and armfuls of North Korean propaganda. And if you think communist propaganda is boring, you're wrong. It's ten thousand times worse than boring. Uh, because boring, you can kind of grit your teeth and get through it, and these stories are almost designed to kill the consciousness of the reader and eliminate critical thought. So I had to, you know, make it humorous, make it compelling, make it interesting. So there are these little bits of wit, but he is not a very uh, witty figure at all. <laughs> uh, everything is said with complete, utter sincerity. Uh, there's n they're not fans of irony in North Korea whatsoever. Uh, certainly not with regard to the leaders who are regarded as some sort of secular religion. Right. So how did you decide when to insert your own you know, flourish, hum humorous flourish? Well, the job of any co-authors, you know, when I work with any of my clients, it's kind of like being a defense attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm helping the person tell their story in the most clear, coherent way possible and the creative narrative that, you know, any reader could follow. I like to call it like writing novels about people who happen to be real. Um, so with this, I, I very much tried to stick to his own verbiage as much as possible. Uh, again, I tried to build a narrative that's fun and interesting to follow, and, and I've, I've gotten very positive response. Uh, because a lot of this stuff, you know, there's pieces here, there's pieces there. It's, it's they're very much intent on obfuscating the truth, uh, North Korea, both internally and for external purposes. So there were no books out there. This is a huge hole in the market, I felt. Uh, to start thinking like a capitalist, that if you want to sit down and read about North Korea and understand their philosophy and understand how they are, th wh why they are the way they are, there aren't any books like that out there. There are, there are some superb books out there that are just very, very dark, very, very depressing, with good reason. Uh, so I wanted to take a lighter kind of perspective, and at the same time, you know, when you're getting the sugar, you're getting the medicine, and realizing this is the big humanitarian crisis of our time. So speaking of lightheartedness. Um, one of the most interesting things about North Korea to me as someone who writes about the internet is that North Korea has become this almost kind of a joke yeah. to the West. Yeah. And th as I understand it, this is something that you wanted to attack uh, head on um, to, to demonstrate that, you know, th yes, there are some things that are kind of humorous to us as outsiders, but also this is a, a literal modern day Holocaust taking place. And so we have to temper any humor that we find in this by you know, recognizing these, these horrors. Right, like any good Eastern European Jew, I have a very dark sense of humor, a very gallows sense of humor. And I think that that is applied in America and the West to North Korea because I don't think people understand just how bad it is. Uh, they understand, you know, that these people have this wacky views about Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung, and they understand that it's kind of a regimented society, but they don't understand things like everyone in the country every week has to stand up in front of their peers and be criticized, and then they have to denounce their colleagues, and if you don't say anything, that's really bad. Uh, and that everyone's, you know, every minute of your day for your entire life you're, is kind of regimented and you're told what to do. Uh, and that, you, don't, you know, things like you don't have access to food because of what your grandparents were doing 50 years ago. Uh, little moments like this, people don't realize just how uh, dark and, and uh, this regime really is. So when they laugh, I, I, I would hope they're laughing w from an informed place as opposed to laughing at a sideshow. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost kind of genius when you s take a step back and look at the Ooh, mechanisms. Let's, let's, oh, I thought you were going to talk about me. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, the, the mechanisms by which uh, the regime prevented any sort of dissent. You know, you, when you're punished, it's not just you being punished. It's three generations. It's, you know, your family gets sent to the Enlightenment camp. Right. Um, you know, the, the self-criticism sessions, which were, which presumably were invented when Kim Jong-il was in grade school, is that? Well, that, that's the claim, that right. Kim Jong-il invented these criticism sessions when he was in uh, elementary school because true comradeship lies